Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. It was a transformative time. He, a remarkable president. It was a turbulent and eccentric era, the time of P.T. Barnum and of Melville, Hawthorne, Emerson, and Whitman, of Doctrines Monroe and Tyler, of Crashes and Clashes. He was the great democratizer, the catalyst of the two-party system, and a brawler, a racist, an agent of genocide. He was Andrew Jackson, the time, America, 1815 to 1848. To talk about Andrew Jackson and his time and the parallels to our time is David Reynolds, Distinguished Professor of English and American Studies at the Graduate Center here at CUNY. He has recently published Waking Giant, America in the Age of Jackson, a magnificent biography of our seventh president and a rich intellectual and social history of the United States from the end of the War of 1812 to the end of the Mexican War. David is also author of the prize-winning John Brown Abolitionist and Walt Women's America and Beneath the American Renaissance, as well as other books and many articles. He's a regular reviewer for the New York Times. Times book review. He is now at work on a book on Harriet Beecher Stowe. Welcome, David. Great to be here, Doug. Great read. Thank Two you. questions. Why this era and why biography? But it's not really biography, it's really cultural and intellectual cultural history. history. Well, for me, biography and cultural history intersect um, because I think each of us is really a product of our time, of our moment, and so many images, even in our subconscious mind, come from uh, the images that are swirling around us in the culture. So sure. to me, uh, that's the way I treat John Brown, that's the way I treat Walt Whitman, that's the way I treat uh, Andrew Jackson and so forth. So uh, to me, I, I try to explore that intersection between the individual and the larger society, and that's basically what I do in this book. Why this era? I mean, the, the John Brown book, the Whitman book, this book, and the Stowe book basically is from 1815 to 1860, that yes. about 45 years. Why this era? Well, what got me fascinated in this era to begin with was that it was the richest cultural era uh, in American history. Mm. You had Emerson, Thoreau, Poe, Hawthorne, Melville, Walt Whitman, a little bit later at the end of the period, Emily Dickinson, all of these uh, people and some great artists, Asher B. Durand, Thomas Cole, the whole Hudson River School, which some people say defines American art. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the rise of popular culture with P.T. Barnum, the rise of the penny newspapers and the tabloids, and it was just such an oh, explosive period, wonderful period. Do you get out of it? I mean, do you, do you have any plans on getting out of this period, or is well, it I so rich? I sometimes feel trapped in it, but I love being trapped in it. I love uh, exploring it. Now I'm doing a book on Harriet Beecher Stowe, and haven't started writing it, but I'm still in the research phase of it. So uh, I don't mind being in it. I love love the period so much. I would like to maybe get into the 20th century a little bit, but that's kind of, I will do one, one thing at a time. And right, so, that 20th century is 40 years in the future. Yeah, Come exactly, on. okay. Exactly. Talking about Jackson, there are three books out on Jackson, Waking Giant, yeah. John Meacham's American Lion, and, and Robert Remini's Andrew Jackson, which was also pre previously published. In, yeah. What is it about Jackson at this moment, or the time at this moment? I truly think that Americans want change, and I think for several years Americans have wanted change political change and even to some degree to, to some degree a kind of a new direction in society and, and so forth and I think that Andrew Jackson above all was a figure of change of reform of uh, departing from the old, old ways he was the first truly democratic president the one that represented the people the first 
He was the first one that wasn't part of the Virginia dynasty or the New England Federalist dynasty. Right. The first one that was born in a log cabin. Uh, he was poor. He was poor. The first one from what was then the West, which was Tennessee. So, uh, and I think that in a way, kind of slips nicely into the whole Obama revolution and all of that. And uh, which, in a sense, begins several years ago when people get a little tired of the whole Bush thing and uh, are kind of looking to the future. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, we'll talk about those parallels. Also, the, these, the, these three works really fill in, and other works fill in the period between the Founding Fathers and Lincoln. We've got yes. a whole rash of books about the Founding Fathers and Founding and Brothers, and then we've got a continuing avalanche of books about Lincoln. And this sort of, these books sort of fit in between that, that period, that, those, those two uh, Yeah, there, there's a renewed interest in that whole uh, interregnum, so to speak, that period between of the Founding Fathers and uh, the Civil War. And people are looking back to that more and more now and recognizing just how important, how crucial that period was uh, as a transition between the founding of the nation and the abolition of slavery mm -hmm. uh, you know, through the Civil War. Okay, now, you describe this period as one of the most turbulent and exciting periods. One of the things that you focus on in the book and that I found the most fascinating were the outliers, as yes. you call them, the philosophers, the writers, the showmen, the cult leaders, yeah. the purveyors of panaceas. You have yes. the mesmerist, the transcendent. Talk about, yeah. you know, as I, I described it earlier, as sort of the wackiness of the yeah. era. Yeah, well, you had, what happened is that after the separation of church and state occurred after the American Revolution, you in a sense had a new freedom of expression, uh, both in religion, in philosophy, in reform movements, and therefore you had a lot of uh, these outliers, people that were very experimental, they were optimistic, um, and you had an explosion of revivalism, religious revivalism, and certain people would go to these revivals and actually think that they not only uh, experienced God, but in a, God, but in a sense became God themselves, and so they they became cult leaders, and they had followers. They would go around the countryside that uh, immense followings, and uh, um, a lot of them had many wives. This was the period when Mormonism arose. Joseph Smith um, had gone to a revival. He thought he uh, and he thought he saw angels that gave him uh, the Golden Books of Mormon that he translated, and that began the, the whole Mormon mm -hmm. uh, church. So. Uh, just an incredible time of creative expression, often associated with religion or re reform, uh, and also fads such as mesmerism, in which people would get on stage and, and could talk in many different languages and see distant countries and, and distant time, time travel and, and time me. traveling. That's right, time traveling, and uh, the audiences really believed this. And spiritualist seances in which uh, tables were being lifted and ghostly hands came in and so oh. forth. It was amazing, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then you could tell people's character and intelligence by feeling the bumps on there, the phrenology. Yeah, phrenology. They believed that uh, uh, by feeling uh, the bumps on one's skull, you could, they could read your character and, in a way, uh, uh, tell your destiny and also warn you that you should uh, uh, work on these certain characteristics that were too big as bumps and you should try to suppress them or exaggerate them. Social movements, though, come out of the serious social yes. movements that have a profound effect. I mean, but they're interrelated. Is what, what you do is point out the causal connections be, between the, sort of the wackiness and the real substantive movements for change, like abolitionism, like women's rights, like temperance, for example. Yes. Talk about those movements and the nexus among those movements and how this is all of a piece. Yeah, to me, uh, among the outliers, there were some crazy people, but also there were some people that really were forward thinking, mm -hmm. who were thinking to the future. And a lot of the abolitionists who really wanted to get rid of slavery, starting with William Lloyd Garrison and going through Elijah Lovejoy and John Brown and, and Harry Beecher Stowe and so forth, these were figures who really uh, were, in a sense, outliers, and yet themselves uh, 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 foresaw social change, very important social mm -hmm. change, in the way that people like uh, Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and the whole civil rights movement mm -hmm. uh, uh, foresaw the kind of social change that would come later on in our era. So for me, the reformers, of course, it takes both reform and politicians, but uh, the reformers were often the ones who looked forward. 
uh, and then the politicians often followed a little bit later on. Yeah, that, I mean, let's let, let's bring this to the current day almost, yeah. almost the current day. Yeah. There was that discussion in the primary season between Hillary Clinton and Barack yeah. Obama, where Barack Obama points to Martin Luther King as the, yeah. the, the, the social reformer that leads to these changes in American society and law. And Clinton responds by saying, wait a minute, it's the politician, it's Lyndon Johnson, who yeah. actually gets Gets the legislation through. So, there, are there, is that a legitimate parallel to what you're? What it is. I think that the reformers are always necessary to look ahead, but I agree that ultimately, I mean, it's not until you get the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, until you get the actual laws in place, that it becomes really meaningful on, on a wide scale. So, I think both have to occur, occur. On that particular conflict, I think I would side with Obama, saying that it really takes that prophecy by the reformers, by the outliers, that prophecy and that boldness up front to kind of pave the way for social change. That's, that's my opinion. And then also, I mean, between this book and the, the John Brown book, you see sort of the evolution of movements from more intellectual to much more actively engaged due to frustration, whatever, until right. you have the explosion with, you know, with Brown first, I guess, yes. in Kansas, and then in Harper's Ferry. Yeah, I mean, most of the early abolitionists, they hated slavery, but they were also pacifists. And uh, um, John Brown came a little later, and he was more of a, uh, more given to violence. And he foresees the Civil War, which was a lot of violence, obviously. Sure. So uh, it did take bl uh, bloodletting, national bloodletting, to get rid of slavery. And John Brown ultimately saw that. But the earlier abolitionists were pacifist, non-resistance, a little more like Martin Luther King. Uh -huh. But that itself is very, very important as well, extremely important. So you cannot discount uh, the early ones uh, j just to praise someone like John Brown or, or, or the later ones. Okay. But at the same time with these abolitionists, they were, they held rather, from our point of view, rather regressive views of race. Well, quite and, often. And of, and of the Negro. Yeah, quite often that was true. I would say the abolitionists in general were uh, closer to being non-racist than obviously figures like Andrew Jackson or many of the presidents, because so many of the presidents were slaveholders themselves. I mean, I think you, you give a number 12 out of the first 14 presidents yeah, or 12, slaveholders? Uh, 12 uh, either owned slaves while they were in office or had owned slaves previously. So. Uh, and, and two and, Supreme Court justices, yeah, two Supreme, John Marshall and right. Taney. And Taney. And then uh, for 50 of the first 64 years of the presidency, uh, um, the executive office was, uh, um, you know, inhabited by a, a, a slaveholder. So wow. you had so many uh, slaveholders in office, including Andrew Jackson and, uh, and George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, on and on and on. Uh, these early presidents who were slave. So that's how far we've come today wow. with Obama uh, uh, representing, obviously, uh, uh, just the, the um, um, ultimate goal of, of getting an African-American in office. Okay, let me jump ahead. I mean, talking about parallels to the current day, on October 31st, you had a post in the Huffington Post called The R Race Factor, How Far We've Come. Talk about that. Give, give, give us your sense of how far we have come and how far we need to go and will we do it? Well, I just mentioned all the presidents who owned slaves. They also uh, had racial views that were unfortunate and are very backward from our perspective. And not only that, but after the Civil War, yes, we did get rid of slavery, but we had years of Jim Crow, we had segregation, uh, we had lynching and all kinds of unfortunate occurrences, racial uh, prejudice. And uh, then it wasn't really until the 50s and 60s that the Civil Rights Movement got, got rid of that, mm -hmm. or, or, or at least diminished, diminished that to some degree, mm -hmm. at least. And so how far we've come today to elect an African-American president is just, just incredible. Mm -hmm. Let's let's switch a moment to Jackson and politics. As I noted in the intro, Jackson was the catalyst of the two-party system. Yes, and in a sense, uh, helped create the, the the second party system. Yeah, talk a little bit about that, and let's move then to the current day. Are we potentially in another inflection point here where the 2008 election may signal a realignment that yeah. sort of occurred in the 1928 or 24, 28 election? Yeah, I think so. I think that Jackson um, ran on the whole idea of reform and of change. 
and he did change the nature of the American presidency. I think that in some ways he changed it for the good. In other ways, for example, he chose a lot of his cronies, his friend, for his first cabinet, and that led to certain problems. Mm -hmm. I think that Obama is taking a little better course. It is true that uh, maybe some people would complain he's, he's choosing Clintonites and so forth. But who's yeah. he going to choose in a Democratic administration? The I last know. Democratic president was Carter. I know, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think that uh, Obama is showing, uh, at the very least, a good pragmatism and not necessarily going after cronies, friends that are close to him. So I think that's a very positive and, and, and good thing about uh, we can't foresee the future, but we can hope that that, that itself is not just, uh, unfortunately, um, um, uh, Jackson did um, um, kind of surround himself with people that were called the kitchen cabinet. These were friends of his that kind of uh, governed a lot of the policy. And, you know, hopefully we won't get that. Yeah, and, and, and also, uh, Andrew Jackson could not become president today. No, no. I mean, he's, you know, his personal behavior, his, no. you know, he's a dualist. He's, he's a, yes. I mean, come talk about Jackson, the man for a second. Tell no, us who well, this guy is. He's a very bold man. He said he never felt the uh, emotion of fear once in his life. He was in three duels. He um, uh, got in all kinds of street fights. He had two bullets in his body. He was uh, just incredible in that sense. His love life is, His love is life. questionable. Yeah, he lived for two years with a woman that he thought that she was divorced, and she thought so too, but she wasn't, so he came under charges of, of uh, adultery and, and all of that. Um, and uh, today he would have a lot of difficulty becoming president because even though he'd be popular, um, it, it was rumored that he had only... Uh, read one other book than the Bible, and that was a novel called The Vicar of Wakefield. And he had gone through law school without uh, reading a book, supposedly, allegedly. So, um, as opposed to someone like Obama. Um, but um, still, for his moment, he was extremely charismatic, extremely. The yeah, people uh, loved him. Yeah, I mean, you talk about the crowds, tens, you know, thousands, yeah. and sometimes tens of thousands of people, which again was reminiscent of. The, the current era with Obama and, in fact, Hillary Clinton, but Obama particularly, this this notion of char the, the charismatic leader. Yes, absolutely. He was, in a way, the president who sort of invents that on a mass level because tens of thousands of people would show up. They went crazy over him. They wanted to touch him if possible or any, any, any way to get close to him. And uh, he was admired for his character, for his common man, identification. He warred against, uh, he challenged the Bank of the United States, and he uh, got into uh, huge policy fights. Yeah, huge policy fights, and he was very, very bold in attacking moneyed institutions on behalf of the common in individual. Oh. Yeah. Do, are there such people on the scene today? Well, I don't know. <laughs> three guesses. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> three guesses. Rape Jackson. I mean, you know, we, we talk about this Paula game of rating presidents. Yeah. How does he rate, not necessarily in, 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 in numbers, but in terms of the, as a president and as a presidency? Yeah. I would say as a presidency, he certainly rates uh, definitely, definitely in the top 10. Ab absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because he really uh, changes the, uh, the nature of the presidency. He's the first one who extensively uses the veto power. Mm -hmm. He changes the sense of the power of the presidency. And to me, he represents two main things. The Walt Whitman once says, in America, there are two great things. There's the capacity for individual expression and the capacity for identifying with other people, for a sense of equality mm -hmm. with other people, those two things. And Andrew Jackson, above all, represents those two simultaneously, wow. uh, simultaneous things, individual power and self-reliance, at the same time, a, a true, uh, uh, genuine identification with a common individual. Interesting. Now, yeah. next book is Harriet Beecher Stowe. Yeah. You, you, you're stuck in that era. Yeah. What is What is it about Stowe that leads you to her? But a more general question is, how do you come to write these books? You wrote, you know, you wrote... Uh, Walt Whitman, you wrote yeah. on John Brown, now you've written Andrew Jackson. How does, how does it happen? Yeah, um, well, uh, that's, that's really funny. It's like an evolution. 
Uh, either I come up with an idea in my mind, like the John Brown book or the Walt Whitman book, or as in the case of Waking Giant or the Harry Beecher Stowe book, uh, a publisher approaches me and I say, that's a good idea, I'd like to do that. And you do it. Uh, and, and I just do it, yeah. yeah. So that's, okay. that's basically what happens. Uh, it's, and uh, other times a publisher might approach me and I don't like the idea. I said, no, I'd rather not do that. But Any books uh, that, that haven't been written and won't be written by well, David Reynolds? Uh, the, you know, someone approached me, a publisher approached me about doing a book on American utopias, uh, utopian communities, which would be a great book. Which you deal yeah, with yeah, in, to, some, to, to in some, some degree, way yes, here. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, I'm thinking about that, but probably I won't do it. I don't know why. I mean, uh, it's a huge project. It's a great project. Uh, but I might maybe suggest another writer to, okay. to uh, do that. We talked about this earlier uh, before we came on the set. 20th century figure that you'd like to do a, a biography yeah. or a cultural biography is who? Yes, believe it or not, I was thinking of doing on Paul McCartney just because... I think he's a powerful figure and a very creative figure, but uh, McCartney's lawyers don't really want, uh, and he himself doesn't want a, a biography to be done at this moment. And so I think I would uh, not beat Sir Paul in court or something like that if I, uh, you know, my agent, uh, uh, Andrew Wiley, knows his lawyers and everything. And, and uh, in a way, that project has been nixed. So, but I'm, I'm always uh, rattling around ideas in my mind. Yeah, and, I'm and, always and, thinking, and, 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 what that suggests, and certainly what this book and the previous book suggests, is the importance of popular culture in, yes. in American society's politics and social and cultural relations. Popular culture. Yeah, Not absolutely. high culture, popular culture. Absolutely. And some of our greatest authors uh, would acknowledge that. I mean, Herman Melville said great writers are parts of their times. And when he wrote Moby Dick, not many people know that there were all these novels before his about white whales and whales crashing into ships. Well, I mean, the, e the Essex, I, I, I recently yes. read two books on that, the, 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 the sinking of the Essex yes, by the yes. whale. Yeah, absolutely. And so he was, he and Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, were very much absorbing popular culture of their era and doing something new with it, doing something fresh with it, but still very much drawing energy uh, from the popular writing that had gone on before mm -hmm. them. So popular culture is very, very important, Ab absolutely. So I, I, want, I want to know the impact of the Beatles, the Stones, Bob right. Dylan on American society and politics. You've got to write the book. Yeah, all right, well, maybe, maybe, yeah. yeah okay. It'd be, it'd be fun. It'd be One fun. of the things that struck me as a political scientist and sort of a student of elections was when you look at the, the campaigning done in this era, it makes modern campaigning, you know, when you talk about negative campaign, it looks like, sounds like church socials. These I people know. were vicious liars and, and, yeah. and character assassins. Yeah. I loved it, but. Yeah, I know, of course. Well, uh, for example, in the 1828 campaign, it was charged by Andrew Jackson's opponents that Jackson uh, had been the uh, the son of a mulatto man and a, a common prostitute, Ooh. and that his brother, uh, Jackson's brother, supposedly was sold as a slave. This was a fabrication. It was, it was a fabrication, but uh, that was one of the charges. Also, it was charged by Jackson's supporters that Adams, John Quincy Adams, had served as a kind of pimp. Uh, in Russia, when he was diplomat in Russia, this was false as well, and had traded the sexual favors of a, a beautiful secretary for political favors from the Tsar of Russia. Wrong, but still, that, the, those were some of the stories that were going on back then. Unbelievable! Yeah, yeah unbelievable. Yeah. Another thing that struck me, again, that that had sort of modern resonances was this is the era of manifest destiny. Yes. And there are clearly parallels, or or not more than parallels, I mean, there it's a continuum to for, the Bush Doctrine, for example, oh, of absolutely. American exceptionalism. Absolutely, yes. Talk about sort of the city on the shining, or the yes. shining, shining city on the hill, and mm. American exceptionalism. It's here. Yes, yes. It's, it's very much still with us, and the idea of the phrase manifest destiny was coined in a Democratic magazine in 1845, just before the Mexican War when we were spreading west mm -hmm. and fighting Mexico and taking over California and Texas and New Mexico and all of those western territories. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the idea that God was behind us as a nation to spread 
democracy elsewhere in the West or, or even elsewhere throughout the world. Wait and a minute, this that, has got resonance. Yeah, exactly, absolutely. Very much looking forward to the Bush Doctrine. Now, I mean, is, is this a core element of the American political psychology that we're, in a sense, you know, the secular Jews, we're God's chosen people, and we've got sort of this divine right and obligation to democratize the world? It's been around uh, since Puritan times, uh, this shining city upon the hill, for all the world to see. That's what John Winthrop said America was. He said that in 1630, and the Manifest Destiny uh, uh, reinforces that and makes it more aggressive in 1845 when that comes along. And then uh, it leads to Teddy Roosevelt and then to uh, the Bush Doctrine. So yeah, absolutely. It's part of the American psyche. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Let's, 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 let's step back to Jackson. If Jackson were around today, what might he advise the new president to do? I think what he would advise the president to do, and I think Obama shows signs of doing this, would be to be self-reliant, uh, to really believe in the idea of the buck stopping here, mm -hmm. that he has to have his advisors. I mean, that's what, in a way, saved Andrew Jackson. I, I said that he, he chose some cronies. Mm -hmm. It's true. But ultimately, it was the buck stops here. Mm -hmm. I have the vision and I am the one who really uh, makes the final decision. So I, I believe that's what he would say. I hope, I think, that that's the direction that Obama's going well, in. Well, at least with, with, with the appointment of, or the nomination, rather, of Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State, there seems to be that element of it there. And I, yes, I mean, yeah. th th people have used the metaphor from the book, Doris Kearns' book title, A Team of Rivals. But yes. I mean, in fact, that it seems to be what Obama's doing. I think so. He's being rather bold, I think, in, in choosing certain people that are not exactly of his particular stamp. And in one case, Hillary Clinton, someone who actually opposed him at one moment. Mm -hmm. I think that that does remind me of the kind of team of rivals. I think that he can make it work through his uh, charisma, through his force of personality. And that's exactly what Andrew Jackson would, would advise him to do. Thank you. That was yeah. great. It went, it went yeah. much too fast, but I thoroughly enjoyed yeah. the book. and. When, when Harriet Beecher Stowe comes out, uh, you're on. Absolutely. I'd love to be here. It's great being on the show. Thank you. Yep. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.